Good morning, everyone. Good morning to uh, all of you, and welcome to the late morning session in the green room. Um, before we start, uh, I have a couple of announcements to make. So first of all, for those of you interested, the reserve paper called uh, Cross-Platform Mobile Malware, Write Once, Run Everywhere, uh, from Sofas Guys is going to take place at uh, 2 o'clock, 2 p.m. in Small Talks Room. So those of you who are interested, please make sure you um, see that presentation. Also, for all the speakers, the speaker's photo is going to take place 12.30 sharp uh, in this room, in green room. So make sure you're here uh, for the amazing photo. Okay. So that's all the announcements. And uh, with that, I'd like to welcome on stage Sean Feng, uh, Michal Chorney, and Stuart McIntyre, who are going to tell us about uh, Digital Bian Lian, um, which is more about what kind of fun malware can have when it gets to your Active Directory. Thank you very much, and over to you guys. Thank you, and good morning. My name is Stuart McIntyre. I'm an analyst in the Dell SecureWorks Counter Threat Unit, where we're, and in my team, we're particularly interested in um, hunting down targeted threats. And with Chun and Michael, I'd like to talk about the skeleton key malware. Um, we originally termed the malware skeleton key because it is an authentication bypass, but the Bian Lang aspect, the face changing aspect of the malware, is because it also allows the threat actor to assume identities of users in Active Directory and perform their actions as whichever user they choose. So the agenda for this talk is first, I'll talk a bit about um, how Dell SecureWorks found the original sample that the white paper is based on. And then um, I'll, um, I'll describe at a high level what it is and what capabilities the skeleton key malware gives the threat actor. And then we'll dig into a bit more of the technical detail um, and give an overview of the content of the paper. And Michael and Chun will describe the technical workings of exactly how it subverts Active Directory authentication. And then we'll wrap up with what we can do about the skeleton key malware. How can we detect it? How can we prevent it uh, from getting onto our domain controllers? And how can we mitigate it? And as I said, this is an overview of the paper. So please ask us any questions at the end or um, later. Uh, the discovery of the skeleton key malware was during a targeted threat hunting project at a customer of um, ours, Dell SecureWorks. We had had quite a long relationship with this customer with several one-off incident response engagements. However, this customer admitted themselves that they didn't have the controls in place to successfully close out and keep out, or to, indeed to detect um, the targeted adversaries that they were facing. So they, they were, and still are, a highly targeted organization. We would find uh, evidence of sabotage so for example, they would see every few months, one of their servers would just be deleted. And we saw a threat, a threat actor run um, just a Dell C star uh, command. We would find uh, remote access Trojans on um, numerous users' workstations. So uh, they had a very real uh, like, uh, uh, constant firefighting mode because of their lack of controls. However, one day when the controls were nearly in place, one of their um, administrators was trawling through the logs uh, because they knew what they were looking He had a rough idea of what he was looking for. He was just looking for suspicious activity that they saw on a daily basis. So this is just him, tra um, uh, Pete, trawling through the logs. Um, he, he, um, he doesn't have anything advanced like log monitoring and he spots a PS exec service um, it, um, on one of the domain controllers. And this appears on all three of their core domain controllers. Uh, and as you may know, PS exec is the legitimate remote administration tool from sysinternals. 
and it, um, it allows commands to be run remotely as highly privileged users. However, none of the administrators recognized what this PSEXEC service uh, was for. So this begs the question. So because their, their controls were nearly in place and they'd had an extensive security improvement program, the locks were nearly in place. It was now worthwhile for us to perform a targeted threat hunting project and then try to determine <clears throat> exactly where all the threat actor touch points were in their environment. So we try and find all of the threat actor touch points that we can so that when we perform closeout, there's, they don't just pop up a month later. So um, to that end, we uh, um, instrument all of the endpoints and all of um, the network egress points and we get our hands on all of the logs we can to give us as much visibility as we can into the customer network so that we have as much knowledge about the threat actor activity or threat actors, in fact, in this case, but we're only focusing on one today that are present in that environment. So what we discovered um, was the cause of this PS exec event was that there was a remote access Trojan on uh, the BlackBerry Enterprise server. And the way we discovered that was it was just persisting as a service, as is, is quite common for, uh, for rats. Um, so we retrieved that binary, we reverse engineered it, and we wrote IDS signatures for it. And we were then able to decrypt its command and control traffic and observe threat actor sessions. So a typical threat actor session, they would do a net use to the domain controller's admin shares. A couple of points here. They had um, separate domain admin accounts, but the threat actor knew all of the domain admin accounts, and the domain admins had pretty strong passwords. So what we found out they were, uh, they were doing was the, they would maintain a list of domain admin passwords. They would, if um, this command failed, they would go to uh, um, the uh, email servers because they're likely to have domain admins logged into them at some point. And then they would dump the passwords with, in plain text with something like Mimikatz. And then if that failed or gave them the same old password they, knew, uh, they had, they would then go to the domain admin's own workstation. So this threat actor had a pretty, pretty good visibility into the organizational structure um, of our customer. And then the next step we would observe in a, a session is that they would copy a DLL called OLE64 DLL to the system32 directory on the domain controller. And they would then run that DLL using run DLL. And at the end of their session, to make life a little bit more difficult for incident responders, they would delete that DLL from the domain controller and from the, domain, and from the BlackBerry Enterprise server. So the PS exec command, this is a good culprit, a likely culprit for the unexplained PS exec on our domain controllers. The uh, DLL, OLE64 DLL has a function ii, which takes an argument that looks a bit like an NTLM hash. So the next thing that we want to do is we, we want to grab a copy of this OLE64 DLL and reverse it and figure out exactly what the, um, that this is doing and what is the impact for our customer and how is it being used. So fortunately, because uh, we, uh, we've got all of our, um, our instrumentation in place, we don't have to wait for a disk image. We can just grab it straight out of the network cap uh, packet captures. So what we found when, uh, when we did a quick triage analysis and reverse engineering of OLE64 DLLs, we found it is indeed a 64-bit DLL. And what it does is it finds the LSAS process, gets the debug privilege on it, and then applies hooks to certain authentication functions 
that relate to Active Directory authentication in the Security Account Manager and the cryptographic libraries. So uh, Chan will describe this in a bit more detail later. But from this a list of functions, CD locate C system, SAMI retrieve primary credentials, and SAMI retrieve multiple primary credentials, we can see that it's probably doing something to the authentication on the domain controller. And one other interesting indicator that we saw among the thousands that we get um, during a targeted threat hunting project was occasionally the threat actor would also run this command. So it's a net use command to use the local admin share using this ad at snow password. So ad is the anonymized uh, name of the domain. And we have an at and a keyword. And when we contacted Jay Smith admin, this wasn't his password. He didn't recognize it. So as I was mulling this over, you may have worked out the connection already, uh, on a run home, it, the idea came to me that we should try and log into the VPN as our user using this password, and it worked. So we then contacted the CISO and asked him to log into the VPN with this password, and that worked as well. So what we had was that the NTLM hash of AD at Snow is the argument that, this, that the OLE64.dll was deployed with. What this means is that the skeleton key password allows access to all of the services that authenticate using Active Directory, and it allows access to them as any Active Directory user. So whoever you try and log in as with that password, it will work. So uh, then we started thinking about the potential impact. So what could you do with this? What, we should, what should we now be looking for now that we know this bit of malware is present on the network? Uh, you can log into um, local workstations with it. If you lock your workstation at night and go home, then if somebody knows the Active Directory password, sorry, the um, skeleton key password, they can come along, unlock your workstation, uh, just appear to the system as you, and then lock your workstation and you'll be none the wiser. And this customer, before their security improvement program, had one factor authentication on all of their remote access services. So that was their VPN, their, uh, their Citrix solution, and their webmail. So the threat actor couldn't affect run a, um, a, effectively a shadow company and log in as anybody they wanted in this organization. So this begs the question, what did they actually do with it? And when we speak of threat actors, they have a capability, so we have a rough idea now, sort of a good idea now actually, of what the skeleton key can do. But unfortunately, because skeleton key login events look exactly like regular login events, it's gonna be a bit trickier to find out what's actually done with the skeleton key. However, the threat actor didn't make any operational security um, errors in this regard. So they didn't make any mistakes like logging in, logging in as multiple users from a single IP or logging in as the same user from multiple IPs. Um, all of the users who had extended working hours longer than say 10 hours uh, were found to be tra legitimately traveling. So we didn't find any anomalies in, um, in the logs. And interestingly, Skeleton Key was also tightly correlated with Active Directory domain replication issues. So although it's, it's um, quite advanced, it's stealthily deployed in that it has no persistence and generates no extra network traffic, it, and the version we observed did have bugs in it, which had plagued the customer for quite a while but were handled as a technical support issue rather than an incident because there's no obvious persistence, there's no files on the domain controllers that, that, that would stick out when they were being in investigated. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, however, because there's no persistence, 
This means that when our customer restarts the, act, uh, the domain controllers to fix the, the domain replication issues, the threat actor then loses the skeleton key authentication bypass. And the, uh, we, we, we observe them returning between eight hours and eight days to restore uh, the skeleton key patch. This suggests that uh, they probably weren't using skeleton key that much or it wasn't business critical to the threat actor. And although they probably wanted to get it back, they, they, um, it, it wasn't critical for them. So just to recap, the capability of skeleton key is that the threat actor who knows the skeleton key password can log in as any user using that password. But normal user logins are um, unaffected. Users can still continue to log in and use services as normal. And the login events that show up in, um, in the log are going to look exactly the same. And after the, the discovery of Skeleton Key, uh, we uh, looked for it wider use. Has this appeared anywhere else? So it was being used in our, um, in our uh, customer's organization by a threat, advert, by, um, a threat actor that we knew was targeting that, that organization. And we'd seen some of their other activities from, our captured, uh, for, from the captured rat traffic. And uh, we, when we had a disk image of that BlackBerry Enterprise server, we saw that a previous version of the skeleton key with additional debug information was compiled in September 2012, but only copied onto that host in March 2014, depending on how much confidence you place in compilation timestamps and file timestamps. Uh, so the, the addition of debug information suggests that the 64-bit DLL was relatively, relatively new. Uh, the version that we saw, OLE64.DLL, was compiled in February 2014 but didn't include the debug information about the patched memory addresses. Uh, we identified a couple of samples on VirusTotal, both of which were from summer 2013. One version was 32-bit and had zero AV detections and was only uploaded by one submitter. And the 64-bit version was uploaded by eight separate submitters from various countries and had about 50% of the antivirus engines detected it, which probably explains why more submitters uploaded it. And then in January 2015, uh, the skeleton key functionality was added to the Mimikatz penetration testing and exploit tool. Thank you. Hi. Uh, now, before we dive into how exactly Skeleton Key works, let's talk a little about <coughs> Windows authentication internals. When we talk about uh, Windows authentication, we basically talk about NTLM and uh, Kerberos. NTLM is an older uh, <coughs> protocol, which is Microsoft uh, proprietary protocol. It's uh, uh, today counted as less secure. It's, uh, and since Windows 2000, Kerberos is uh, the default authentication protocol with Microsoft. And TLM is uh, still used and still very much alive, though. It's used, obviously, when a service is not Kerberized. It's used when a client can't access Kerberos domain controller. It's used when a service is accessed by IP, for example. Kerberos, on the other hand, is an open standard. And as I said, it's now the default. Let's see how NTLM works. NTLM is not standalone protocol. It's uh, always embedded within an application. But it's not aware, not of or not of the service it's being authenticated, not and not of the protocol which wraps it. It's a challenge response-based protocol, meaning a client uh, sends to the server its username, says I want to authenticate. Uh, server says here is your challenge. Uh, client with a, a long-term key of the user, which is basically derivative of the password or uh, NTLM hash, uh, encrypts the challenge and sends it back to the server. Now, server needs to validate uh, the user's identity by decrypting the, the challenge and see if it's successful encrypt, decrypts it. But in domain-based uh, environments, it does not possess the user password, so it sends it to the domain controller. And uh, if a domain controller with its own copy 
of the long-term tip, the, the NTLM hash successfully decrypts that challenge, it will send back to the server everything is good, and also will uh, send the authorization info for server to uh, enforce authorization policies. And now server can say, uh, tell to the client, okay, let's, everything is good, let's go on, that's it. Kerberos, on the other hand, supports multiple encryption algorithms. Uh, the older one, uh, the DES and uh, RC4, and the new one, AS128 and uh, AS256. Uh, in a high level, it works like uh, clients send to the authentication server of Active Directory in, of Kerberos domain controller, uh, I want to authenticate. If everything is good, uh, domain controller will say, here is your ticket. Ticket is basically uh, used later for proof of user identity. It's ticket granting ticket. <coughs> but uh, later when the user wants to access a specific service, it will come back to the uh, Kerberos domain controller and say, here's my TGT. He will not have to do to enter its uh, credentials again, meaning uh, this is how a single sign-on works in Windows. And the uh, Kerberos domain controller, given that the TGT is valid, will return uh, back the service ticket. Now, one important detail here is that uh, since uh, Kerberos supports multiple algo uh, encryption algorithms, uh, client and the Ker Kerberos domain controller need to perform a handshake to come to agreement which uh, algorithm to use. So when uh, authentication as request is sent, client sends uh, which encryption types it supports. And uh, the domain controller looks at which of the long term, which of the versions of the long term key of the user, which is uh, again uh, the hash of the password, it has, and returns them uh, according to also to what client supports. Now, uh, there are two known techniques to prevent or to make it brute force more difficult, since we said that many of the things which uh, uh, sent between a uh, client and the authentication site are encrypted with uh, user's password, the brute force of that would allow uh, to discover the user's password. There are two known techniques to make it difficult, more difficult, one is salting, which goes is that even if two, same, if two different users uh, have same password, the long-term key, the hash, would be different. This is done by appending a salt string to the password while building the hash. In case of AS, uh, this salt is the, the username. RC4 HMAC uh, encryption doesn't use any salt. Another technique is key stretching. It basically, its goal is to increase the CPU required per single password uh, to be able to check if it's valid or not. Uh, uh, what it does, it's on one hand, it does not hamper the user experience per so single uh, login because it's increased the time from nano to milli or microseconds. But the massive uh, brute force of many, of many passwords become uh, drawn non-effective. AS uses PBKDF2, which is password-based key diversion function 2, which is a standard for how to do it. It's basically doing a thousand rounds of uh, SHA. RC4 HMAC, again, uh, doesn't uh, do any key stretching. Now I will give to Chun. Thank you. So now <coughs> I'm going to explain uh, how skeleton key works. So first of all, I will explain <coughs> how does skeleton key to temper the NTRM authentication. So uh, we reversed the code and we find that actually uh, skeleton key, the patches a function in msv1 underscore zero dot DRL. The function name is called msvp password validate. This function is used by Microsoft to validate the password. By the way, uh, it's not an exported function and also it's not documented. So basically, the patch the code, what it does, first of all, it calls the original version of MSVP val password validate. So why it needs to do this? Because it needs to make sure if the user is logged in with their own username, password, it has to make sure they can log in 
And then the second, then the second step, if the first step fails, then it replaces the NTRM hash retrieved from the SAM, which is the security account manager, with the skeleton key hash. Uh, let's have a look at this picture, probably would be more clear. So if we have a look at here, so the password has been uh, hashed and generating the password hash. So normally it would be compared with the one uh, retrieved from the SAM. But when the scattering key is working, it replaces the hash is going to be compared rather than the one retrieved from the SAM. It's going to be compared with the one with scattering key hash. This means if the user is logging with the scattering key password, it's always going to work because this comparison is always going to return true. Okay, so next, uh, let's have a look at how does it uh, temper the Kerberos authentication. Uh, temper Kerberos authentication is a bit uh, more difficult. So first of all, it needs to downgrade the encryption to the RC4 uh, HMAC algorithm because so it needs to avoid the using the sort, for example, AES. And the second thing is the hash uh, is exactly the same as NTRM hash, the hash algorithm. So basically what it does, it hooks the same eye retrieve multiple primary credentials. And it checks for the package name, Kerberos newer keys. If it finds this package, it always returns status DS, no attribute or value. So what it does here is basically it's going to filter out all those like uh, uh, hash with the AES, which is using the uh, sort. Okay. So what it does, okay, so it patched the decryption function in CD locate system structure. So first of all, it's similar to the NTR hash. So first it calls the original version to make sure the normal locking would still work. If this fails, then it replaces the hash retrieved from the active, direct active directory with the skeleton key hash, then it calls the decrypt again. The same, if the user is logging with the skeleton key password, it's always going to work. Okay, that works possible. Uh, now, uh, regarding the detection, uh, as we explained so far, the essence of the uh, skeleton key behavior is the encryption downgrade it performs on, on the Kerberos uh, and uh, related to the handshake I described earlier. So if we have uh, this behavior uh, can be seen very clearly on the network, therefore, uh, for example, it can be done either passively by a network device uh, the network monitoring, uh, the Microsoft's new product, Microsoft Threat Analytics, is doing just that. It uh, monitors all the traffic going in and out of Active Directory. So if we see that an account which previously uh, a client would say that uh, it supports AS, and we know that Active Directory uh, does has the AS keys because it's, let's say, early uh, advertised support for it, for that account, and now when the client comes and say, this is my supported types and okay. uh, domain controller suddenly will say, no, uh, you only have RC4 and below, uh, it means mean basically that the encryption was downgraded. So this screenshot here, basically we say we saw the downgrade, uh, it probably means that uh, this is, it may mean that you have a skeleton key. In our way is uh, to do a active a network discovery, which is basically a script run by, script written by Tileberry from Microsoft. It works the, the following way, very similar. It uh, find, verifies that the Active Directory is uh, of domain function level 2008 or above, because before that AS is not supported. It finds AS supported uh, account, uh, the one which we know for sure has AS keys in, the, in the Active Directory. It actively sends the authentication request to the domain controller while advertising from the client side that only AS type is supported. Now we know that the domain controller have its key, so it must be it must be supported. But if it fails, meaning the domain controller says I don't support it, it means the, the encryption is downgraded, and it means uh, that the uh, domain controller probably infected with uh, skeleton key malware. Uh, the script is publicly avail available for download. This is the link. Uh, now we'll show. Do you have time? 
We'll skip the video because we don't have time. In memory. Uh, we can detect the skeleton key in memory by checking for the function hooks it places into LSAS.exe's um, uh, imports. However, there are some problems with this. It's quite labor intensive, um, either instrumenting your domain controller or uh, quite skill intensive to get memory dumps from your domain controller and inspect them for hooks. Uh, furthermore, the threat actor may change the hooking mechanism or they could change the code um, quite, um, quite easily. Although one thing that we noticed was that the, the area that the, patch it, that the patches were written into, the, uh, the pages were page execute read write. So the threat actor didn't take the right permissions off those pages. And as we discussed, um, there's probably no good reason for processes to have right access in, um, into LSAS, or very few good reasons. We can use the more general control of log monitoring and security information and event management to detect um, skeleton key deployment. As I mentioned previously, the authentication events aren't really distinctive in, in the logs. They look like a normal user. So, we may, so with, with the correct um, set of filters, we may be able to detect deployment of skeleton key and possibly other malware, for example, from unexpected uh, service controller events for new services, whether that's PS exec or um, a remote access Trojan persistence, or if you have privileged user management, unexpected use of admin credentials, or you may have uh, process audit watch lists. Okay, so I will quickly just uh, uh, explain about the mitigation. So basically, in short words, we want to use the two uh, factor authentication to protect the confidential data. In Windows 10, we have the built-in support. You can use the fingerprint, you can use the phone. Okay, so now conclusion. Uh, scheduling key targets active uh, directory authentication, and the scheduling key tempers with the NTRM and the Kerberos authentication. Uh, scheduling key can be detected on the wire. Scheduling key can be detected in the memory or by the log monitoring. So we suggest two Fact authentication is recommended for confidential data access. So I'm sure any questions? Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, are you scared? Um, right, do you have any questions for the guys before you run away to check your own Active Directory? Do we have any time for questions? Sorry, no time for questions. Please approach you guys after, um, after the presentation. Thank you.